you open your Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 2? Let's read beginning at verse 12. We've been looking into these letters to the seven churches. Seven letters, a letter to each of the seven churches of Asia, written, of course, near the end of the first century. And of course, we see the condition of the church as we take them all together in that time. But we also understand that these are seven letters sent to all seven churches in book form. And they set forth the church in all ages. And therefore, as we hear these letters, we don't hear it for the church at uh, Pergamos or the church at Smyrna or Ephesus. We hear it for us. And since each letter concludes with a he that hath ears to hear, let him hear in the singular, we individually must hear. The church can't, as a body, hear. The church can't repent, but individuals can. And so we need to hear them as individuals. I want us to pray first, and then we'll read the passage and and get into the message for today on friendship with the world. This is part two. We considered this same letter last week. And uh, but we see here the evils of friendship with the world and what our Lord thinks of it, having his two-edged sword, his sharp two-edged sword, as he delivers the letter, as he dictates the letter to this church. Beginning at verse 12, to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp two-edged sword. <clears throat> this identifies him as one of, according to one of the characters in which he is seen in vision in chapter one. In verse 16 it says, and he in his right hand has the seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So this is of course the Lord Jesus Christ is the judge of the church standing over the church addressing it by letter. I know thy works, he says, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Twice he said that. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. The world is the devil's domain. We know that. The Apostle Paul referred to the devil in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 as the God of this world. Now we know it's our Father's world. He's the creator of it. He's still the sovereign over all things. But this earthly domain is the domain of Satan. When God inquired of Satan where he had been, he said, running to and fro in the earth. That's his domain. 
So he dwells here wherever we live. We don't live at Pergamos, but wherever we live, Satan's presence and influence is there. We know that. His demons, doctrines, moral corruption is in every place. And that is in every city without exception. Now we know that there are certain cities where it seems like that his influence is stronger than it is in other places. But Jesus said twice over of Pergamos that Satan dwelt there and that his seat was there. It's like he had his, his ruling government set up in the gate of the city and his seat was there. And then in a very real way, he was the ruler of that city. I mentioned last week we have some that we could name across our land where we could say certainly Satan's seat is there. Someone suggested after service last Sunday, I, I didn't mention Washington, D.C. I think that might be at the top of the list of those cities in America where Satan's seat is. But I'm afraid it may be here in St. Louis as well. But wherever you live, whatever your hometown is, I can guarantee you that Satan's influence is there, his presence is there, because he is the God of this world. By his pagan deities and his antichrist forces that were all over the city of Pergamos, he was ruling. He was making his power and his influence known over the city. But you know, the most significant evidence of Satan's work there in Pergamos and any other place is when you find Balaamite, Nicolaitan corruption in the church. The greatest evidence that Satan is at work, and believe me, though he is in all of the bar rooms and the honky tonks and the casinos and all of those things, he's there, his influence is there, but he targets the church and there's nothing that he would rather destroy than a church and how is he going to do it other than by infiltrating it with false doctrine and especially such false doctrines as the Balaamites promoted, the Nicolaitans that were present in the church at Pergamos. Our Lord addressed this church in a particular character as I pointed out. He had a sharp two-edged sword. And in that character, he addresses this church. Yes, he is the defender of the church. That, that sword has two edges. And against all of those that were persecuting it, the Lord is the defender. And even though he allowed the persecution to go on and the church at Smyrna, he allowed it to go on. He offered them no relief whatsoever. He just said, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life and you'll be overcomers of the second death. You be faithful unto death. That was the word that he gave them but he didn't promise them relief. In the case here at Pergamos, they were undergoing persecution too. He names one Antipas that had been martyred for the faith, but he commends them. He said, even in the place where Satan dwells, where Satan's seat is, you have not dipped your colors. You have not denied the faith. He said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father in heaven. They had not done that. There was a, a strong nucleus in this church and they were faithful. Even unto death, they were faithful. But yet... He had something against them. There was a problem here. He stands as the judge of the church. It's a two-edged sword. He's ready to bring judgment against those who are imbibing the doctrines of the Nicolaitans and are promoting these things. And of course, it would be seen in the lives of the people of the church, those that profess to be 
Christians, it would be seen in their lives, the evidence that Balaamite doctrine has found a home here in Pergamos. And therefore he stands with his sword. And he says there, as I pointed out, that he, he will come quickly. He said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. That is the false prophets and those that were imbibing their doctrine and those whose lives were showing that they were hearing the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. He said, I hate that doctrine. Why did he hate it? Because of what it produced. They were teaching that these people could go to the idol temples and they could participate in their feast and eat the meat offered to idols and all that and participate in the lewdness that went along with their worship and still be Christians. No, those are not his and they must be severed and they must be cut out of the church if they are truly his and have fallen that far, they have backslidden that far then they better repent or else, he said. But many of them were no doubt not the Lord's and they needed to be taken out of the church. He said that in his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. And we know that that is emblematic of the word of God itself. And the discipline of the church is done primarily through the preaching of the word of God. There are Cases where if someone is involved in fornication, living in, in sin, that it is the, the duty of the church to bring them before the church and remove them from the church. That is the duty. But primarily, the discipline of the church is done through the preaching of the Word of God. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the Word of God is. So when the Word is preached, then it disciplines the people as we hear the Word and we're convicted of our sins and we repent of our sins. That's the ideal. If that doesn't correct the problem in the church, and it's known, then the individuals, the guilty ones, have to be removed by church discipline. But it's the word out of his mouth. And here he addresses the, this church by this letter himself. And he intends for this word to correct them. It is the word out of his mouth. It is a sharp sword. And he said, you repent or else I will come. And you don't want that. To, for me to come in judgment, for me to come and wield this sword, that you don't want that. Repent or else I will come. So the ideal is to be disciplined by the word of God, be corrected by the word of God, to repent of our sins and get our hearts right. Never First of all, never to allow the Nicolaitans in, never to allow their doctrine to be entertained, to say, no, that is contrary to the scripture. We cannot sin that grace may abound. We've been saved. Jesus' name is Jesus because he saves his people from their sins, not in them. So we're to, we're to guard ourselves as he tells them here. But as he stands as judge over this church, expressly hating this doctrine, threatening to come, do something about it if they don't get it straight. Even their bold and courageous stand against fierce persecution could not prevent this judgment. You saw what he said about them. He was praising them for being bold and strong and courageous not denying him even in the toughest situations where their lives were threatened, where they were, torture was threatened. In that city, they worshiped many gods. as We went over the list of them last week. But one that all had to worship was Caesar himself. And if they would 
pay their worship to Caesar, then they would receive a certificate and they could worship the God of their choice then, or however many gods they wanted to. And that means that Christians here, they were permitted to worship Jesus if they would bow to Caesar first and get clearance. Then they could go worship God. And they refused. They would have no king but Jesus. And they would bow to no earthly king, period. And even if it cost them their lives, they would not do it. And that's why they were receiving such heavy persecution. And he commends them. He said, in this city where Satan dwells and where his seat is, and yet you have not denied my name. The sword, as I said, was a symbol of the power of his word. His word cuts deep. It convicts. It pierces the heart. You know, the Lord, that mighty word, and we talk about the word of God and the importance of the word of God and not being willing to sacrifice a single syllable, not ever adding to it or taking from it. It is God's complete revelation to us. There is nothing that can be added to it. Nothing that can be taken away from it. That's why some of the temporal gifts ended when the word of God was complete. That's why that there are not tongues anymore. Not truly, according to the scripture, not in the scriptural sense. No need for them. That was an extraordinary means of revelation. There are no more prophets in the sense of those that receive a message from God and deliver it to the church like the Old Testament prophets did. Now there are prophets in that there are preachers, but not that kind of prophet. Why? Because the word of God, the revelation is complete. We don't need any more revelation. It's God's complete word. And we herald the word of God. We preach the word of God. We have no other confidence but God's holy word. And you can see the power that it has. It cuts, it, it convicts. But you know, as it kills, it also makes alive. Hosea said, or rather the Lord said in Hosea, I have slain them by the word of my mouth. I have hewed them by the holy prophets. He sent the prophets forth preaching the word of God and by that he hewed them and he slew them because the word has that kind of power. I'm glad it does. The word of God had power enough to convict me and slay my sins, to grant me repentance and faith in Christ. It kills and it makes alive. It is that incorruptible seed by which we're born again. That is, we're made alive. But it also slays all of the natural goodness of man, the things that we trust in. The grass withers and the flower thereof falleth away. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord breathes upon it. Because He takes the Word of God and He wipes it out. But he gives new life by the power of the gospel. And Peter said, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now we see Satan's diabolical work and aim here at Pergamos, same as it is every place. He's working against Christ here. That's his name, Antichrist, against Christ. Christ desires that the people remain faithful unto the end and receive the crown of life. But Satan's aim is to cause them to deny the faith. Somehow get them to deny. Either by persecutions or by infiltrating the church with false corrupt doctrines and cause them to apostatize and deny the faith. 
He had failed to accomplish this through violent persecution. Why not then try to lead them into apostasy? And that way he could destroy them from within. That was what he intended to do, using cleverly modified doctrines. Thou hast them there that are of the doctrine of Balaam. Thou hast them there also, or thou also has them there. The Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were the New Testament version of the Old Testament Balaamites. It's not two different types of heresies that he is speaking of here. He's not saying you've got the Balaamites there and not only that, you've got the Nicolaitans. No, he's saying you've got the Balaamites just exactly like the children of Israel had the Balaamites, you've got the Nicolaitans and there's not a nickel's worth of difference in their doctrine. They were teaching the same thing. By our knowledge of the doctrine of Balaam, we can know the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, what it was. As I explained last week, when he says here in verse 15, and hast thou also them, he's saying, likewise, you have the same thing in your church. They're not called Balaamites, but they're Nicolaitans. Same difference. And I'm glad for that because I have always felt in my studies of scripture and finding this doctrine and other descriptions of it in other places where the name is not mentioned. I have always contended that the Nicolaitans were preaching this, uh, they were turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, as Jude speaks of. And that's exactly what they were doing. Saying that you can be a Christian and still live like the world. You can be a Christian and still continue in your adulterous relationship. You can be a Christian and do all the things that the world does because after all, Christ has finished the law, he's done away with it, we're now under a different law. No, the law of liberty is the gospel but it never gives liberty to sin. We're not at liberty to sin. Christ hates that doctrine. That ought to be enough to steer us away from it. Anyone away from it to hear those words, I hate it. God hates all sin. Our Lord hates all sin, but there's some sins that he specifically says, I hate. Like slaying the innocent. Murdering Thousands and thousands of babies every year. He said, I hate the shedding of innocent blood. He hates the putting away. He hates the doctrine of Balaam. The things that he hates. I would say that we're well advised to stay away from the things that he hates. And if he hates them, then we need to hate them. Now, quite literally, in the early church, their worldliness took the form of literally eating things offered to idols and committing fornication. I think I mentioned last week the reason that was included in the letter that went out from the Jerusalem Council to all of the churches for the Gentile converts, including eating things offered to idols and strangled and so forth, and fornication. And we read that and we think, that's a no-brainer. Why would they not know that? Why would they have to tell them that? Why would you have to tell any Christian, you got to abstain from fornication? That's a no-brainer. It was because this was a prominent thing in the first century. It was literally taking place. And so they put that in the letter. But in the spiritual or the figurative sense, the term stands for 
all different kinds of conformity to the world. You find that both in the Old Testament and in the New. Terms like whoredoms and adultery and fornication. Yes, the literal sins, the actual sins are forbidden, but the sins that they figuratively represent, the worldliness is also forbidden, just as much so. We know that God often spoke, complained of his people Israel, and you know how that they were up and down. They were like a roller coaster. They would repent, there would come a reform, and they would get right, and then the first thing you know, they're off into chasing off after other gods. And God said to them, Why trimmest thou thy ways to seek love? That is to seek, seek your strange lovers. God entered into a covenant relationship. He entered into a marriage relationship with Israel. He said, Thee only have I known of all the nations of the earth. The same word that is used when Adam knew Eve. Adam knew his wife. And he, God says of Israel, Thee only have I known. He had avouched himself to them, Deuteronomy 26 17, and they had avouched themselves to him, Deuteronomy 26, 18. They had entered into a marriage covenant, God and the people there at Sinai. So when they went, he says, a whoring after other gods, they were being unfaithful as a wife. He was always true and faithful to them. And of course, that's the whole picture of the book of Hosea, the early chapter. Hosea, as he takes a wife of whoredoms, that's what is setting forth, this very heinous sin and the, the chasing off after the world by God's people. And in the New Testament, it's the same way. James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? He's not saying that they are all literally adulterers and adulteresses. But they were worldly. And that's what he's condemning, their love of the world. Now we've repeatedly noted that these letters are intended for the churches of every age. And so let us ask this question. Do we have any Nicolaitans around today? Who are essentially saying, let us continue in sin? They're saying it out loud. It's not like that you got to uncover it and discover it. No, they'll stand up and brag about it. Now, oh, I, don't, I can take this beer and drink it. I have liberty. I heard a preacher say that. What kind of liberty? What is it you're not allowed to do? Well, according to them, I guess not anything. You can just do whatever you want to do. You're saved by grace. Nothing can change it. God, but you know, Paul had something to say about it. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein was his answer to his own question. He knew what they were thinking. He anticipated what they were going to say. And he answered it before they could even ask. And we can always do that. We have the word of God. We can answer that question before it's ever asked. So who are these that are essentially saying that we can continue in sin? Who are the Nicolaitans today that the law is done away, that Christ has put an end to it? We don't have to worry about that. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. 
He fulfilled it for us, but he did not free us from the standard. And as a matter of fact, in the new covenant, we have that same law written in the fleshy tables of the heart. He put it in the heart. God said, I will put my spirit in them. I will give them a new spirit and I'll give them a new heart and I'll take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in them and they shall keep my judgments to do them. He puts his spirit in us. He puts his law in our hearts. He writes them on the heart. So to say under the new covenant, we have this liberty to sin, God forbid. Just the opposite. He puts the law in the heart so that the commandments are no longer grievous. We love being obedient. To God. Not that we're doing it perfectly. We still have the flesh to contend with. But we don't give the flesh free reign and say it doesn't matter. We have liberty. No, we fight it like Paul did there in Romans chapter 7. Constantly fighting against the tendencies of the flesh. These show up in many places, sometimes in unexpected places. I'm shocked sometimes to hear where I learn of these heinous heresies being taught. They assume different titles, promote different kinds of liberties. For example, some are out and out antinomian. They just simply teach a positional sanctification exclusively. It has nothing to do with your actual practical sanctification. There are some that teach that salvation comes, can come in phases. You get saved and you can be a carnal Christian for a while. And then you can just stay that way if you want to. But if you want to be a spiritual Christian, then you can make Christ Lord later on. But that is heresy. The Bible says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Some are known as Christian libertarians. They just simply turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Anything goes. Some call themselves intersectionist, embracing all forms of perversions in the church, had a church here in the St. Louis area that was supposed to be sound and Bible-believing and fundamental. They entertained all of the, they called it the intersection gospel. Nothing is excluded. If you're homosexuals, you just come right on. We'll, we'll receive you and homosexual marriage and all of this, no problem. That which God says is an abomination and they're embracing it. I say, and we find these things in places where we don't expect to find them. I would have never expected that from that church. Yet there it was. The Nicolaitans were there and they were being embraced. And this was a conference. I mean, they had gathered churches around, people around from all over the country to celebrate their intersection gospel. There was no kind of perversion that they would not embrace and welcome in, like the church down in Alabama published their, what I suppose were supposed to be like their articles of faith. We have our articles of faith. Our articles tell us what we believe about God, what we believe about the Trinity, what we believe about the Holy Spirit, what we believe about the church. All of these things we have in our articles of faith. Their articles stated that all sexuality is good. God receives it all. He recognizes it all. The woman's Control of her body is hers. Nobody can tell her what to do with that baby in her body. It's her body. That was another one of their articles. Another was, there are no, there's no such thing as an illegal alien. 
They're all legal and they're all welcome. All of these things sound like it came from the liberals' manifesto rather than from a church. There were seven of them. I can't remember them all, but they're all just as disgusting as those. There was an evangelical pastor in Kansas City that was serving notice to all of his evangelical Bible thumpers out there. But he and his church were embracing abortion. There was nothing wrong with it. The murder of the innocent. The very thing, one of the very things that God said he hates. And I believe one of the very things that will bring God's judgment upon a nation. How many millions of innocent lives has been taken, destroyed. But this church was embracing all of these things. Why, intersection, we all cross paths right here. And all of these have in common, like the Nicolaitans, one thing. They all call themselves Christian. They also seem to ignore what the Bible says about worldliness. Don't you know, James said, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Love not the world, John said, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's pretty strong language from the apostle of love. Come out from among them. Paul says, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. But come out from among them and be ye separate. Now the enormity of this evil is more fully seen by the whole language of Christ to this church. Verse 12, he presents himself as the one with a sharp two-edged sword. He expresses the need for sharp, penetrating judgment in the very title that he assumes, in the very character that he takes. He shows the need for judgment. It's a matter of repent or else. Verse 16, Repent, or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. First is the imperative. Repent. And then comes the or else. We say that sometimes. I've heard parents say that to their kids. I've probably done it myself. You do this or else. You stop that or else. Or else what? The Lord says here, repent or else. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. It kind of reminds me of what we read in the first chapter of the book of Micah. God is ready to come down in judgment. He has his sword drawn and he said, repent or I will come down and you do not want me to come down. I know when my dad would issue such a, a demand as that, you stop that or I'm gonna come down there. We knew that it better stop. When God says it, we better know that he means it. You repent, you turn from this, you turn from this worldliness, you get this out of your church. Or I'm going to come down there and I am going to deal with them. Notice how carefully he distinguishes between the guilty and the rest. I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them. The 
these two promises that follow this, I don't have time to get into this morning. I want to deal with them on Wednesday night, I think. But in verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, to him that overcometh. You repent, make this right, you get this right, and I will give to eat of the hidden manna. There is a promise there that goes back to the Old Covenant, just like all of these promises are taken from the Old Testament. And this one has to do with that manna that was hidden in the ark, not the manna that's scattered on the ground and they went out and collected it every day. That too was a type of Christ. But this is a type of that manna that was hidden in the ark. And it was in the Holy of Holies. And it was covered by the mercy seat. And it had the cherubim with spread wings over it. This is that manna that speaks of Christ himself in as we shall feed on him one day in glory. Now we have the manna every day, the daily bread. We have, we feed on Christ daily, but then it's going to be a communion and a fellowship with Christ that we only have the foretaste of here. And then that white stone, which I believe is taken from the same era. Some say this, identify this with some pagan um, type of procedures of judging and the court of law and all. But all of these others are taken from scripture. All these others are taken from the history of the children of Israel and God's dealing with them. And I can't help but believe this is one of the stones in that curiously wrought breastplate that the high priest wore. And he consulted the will of God. And the white stone, which supposedly bore the name of Jehovah on it. It was a name that only the high priest saw. It was only known to him that received it, the high priest. And the name of Christ, as he will be known in glory, will only be known by them who receive him. We'll see that Wednesday night. I want to deal with this on Wednesday night. But I tell you, it's a blessing you don't want to miss. It is the fulfillment of what we have in earnest here below. What we have a foretaste of here. But then in its fullness in heaven. Let us not continue in worldliness. Individual Christians come out from among them. Be a separate. Do not touch the unclean thing. God said, if you do that, I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters. Come out from among them. Repent or else. I hope that wherein we are guilty, that we will truly repent. Wherever we see ourselves drifting away, being allured by the world. Let us repent. Or else we may continue down that path to apostasy when he has to cut us completely off.